And the question is this. As I read the book of Acts, I learned that it was some 15 years or so into Paul's ministry that they had the big meeting in Jerusalem concerning circumcision and the law. I have to assume that Peter and the other apostles still preached the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews, which was faith in Christ Jesus by keeping God's commandments. If I'm correct so far, being new at this, my question is simple. Did Peter and the apostles believe and teach that a person had to keep the law as well? And what did they teach concerning ongoing sacrifices since the sacrifices were part of the law? So the, 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 to boil it down, even after that meeting in Acts 15, did Peter still preach a man had to do works? The gospel of the kingdom required works of man to prove their faith. Um, and then what about the sacrifices in the law? When Jesus shed his blood, wasn't that the final sacrifice? So that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, and again, as we saw in our study in Galatians 2, on Wednesday night, Peter and the Jewish apostles did not even know the gospel that Paul preached among the Gentiles until he came up to Jerusalem 14 years after his conversion and communicated it to them. Paul preached that a man is justified by faith alone without the deeds of the law. Now, the church in Jerusalem was teaching the law. I mean, that, that's what Jesus told them to teach. In Matthew 5, he said that he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And he said, if any man that would teach otherwise, that would not teach the commandments and not teach the law, would be least in the kingdom of heaven. And um, he told them, obey them that sit in Moses' seat. <laughs> Matthew 23. That's at the end of his ministry. Uh, they're, they're going to the temple in Jerusalem. The little flock. They're following things concerning the law. In fact, in Acts 21, that's well down the road after the cross. Uh, James told Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous of the law. So, I mean, what about that? Didn't Peter acknowledge in Acts 15, remember we looked at this in our study in Galatians, he said uh, he, he considered the law a yoke of bondage. So how, I mean, how does all this work? And it, it's kind of complicated, but let me just say a couple things. Hopefully that will be a help. Um, you need to understand that there is no indication that Peter, James, and John changed their ministry after Acts 15. Okay, uh, when they gave to Paul and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, it wasn't an agreement that now they all had the same ministry. It was an agreement that they were going to stick with the circumcision and Paul would go out to the heathen. There's no indication that just because they knew Paul had a new ministry from the Lord, that now they're going to do it too. In other words, I believe they maintain their same ministry they had. Of course, they're not offering the kingdom to Israel anymore because Israel falls in Acts 7. But they're maintaining the little flock with the promise showing them from the Word, word of God, uh, understanding that Paul got new revelation that the, the second coming and all of that was, was on hold, but it would be fulfilled. So they maintain that calling. And uh, really, to understand what the Jewish apostles believed and taught about matters, you ought to read their epistles. <laughs> if you want to understand it, you read Hebrews through Revelation. These are Hebrew epistles. And some of these were written after Acts 15. I know 2 Peter was. So when you study Hebrews through Revelation, you're going to find some glaring absences of doctrine. You're not going to find justification by the faith of Christ. Instant permanent justification like Paul taught it by the faith of Christ. You're going to find a man has to be justified by his own faith, which must work. James chapter 2 for an example. You're not going to find one mention of the body of Christ in Hebrews through Revelation. The church that God is building in this age, it's not even mentioned in Hebrews through Revelation. You're not going to find any reference to our blessed hope 
of being caught up to meet the Lord in the air before the 70th week of Daniel. That's not what it deals with. It deals with the second coming of Christ back to the earth. And so they did not start teaching Paul's doctrine uh, now that they knew some things about it because t really they didn't grasp a lot of things that Paul was teaching. They just acknowledged it was of the Lord. Look in Hebrews chapter 7. Let me give you a couple verses that might be a help. Okay, as far as the sacrifices are concerned, if you want to know what the kingdom church thought about all that, believed about all that, study the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is the doctrinal book of salvation for them like Romans is for us. And it's clear in the book of Hebrews that animal sacrifices cannot take away sin, only the blood of Christ. Okay, so for the nation Israel, their sins as a nation will be blotted out at the second coming under the new covenant. Okay, now of course in this age of grace, we receive the atonement the moment we believe. It's, we don't have to look for it or wait for it. There's a difference of application. Okay, Romans is about the blood of Christ. So is Hebrews. The difference is how is it applied? Now what you need to understand about the law, this is a key verse in Hebrews. Hebrews 7 verse 12. Where it says, for the priesthood being changed. Alright, well, Christ is the great high priest. He's not after the priesthood of Aaron, but of Melchizedek. That's what the context is bearing out. So that's a change. Because the high priest was supposed to be of Aaron, according to the Mosaic law. The priesthood being changed... There is made of necessity a change also of the law. All right, so what we know is in the kingdom age, the law will go forth out of Zion. They're observing the law. But it's not exactly the same as it was in the Old Testament because they're under the new covenant. There are some changes because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And it's not a yoke of bondage because they're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, keeping it from the heart. God will write His law on their heart and cause them to do His commandments. Okay? The fact is, when Israel is saved as a nation, it's going to be by the grace of God. Peter talked about that in 1 Peter 1. The grace that is brought to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, to be a part of that, they have to reject the Antichrist. They have to be faithful. But when the Lord comes and puts them under that new covenant, that law is a law of liberty, not a yoke of bondage, because they're filled with the Holy Ghost. But you have to understand, look, and I believe that they'll offer some animal sacrifices, but it's not going to be exactly like it was. And technically, look, animal sacrifices in the Old Testament didn't take away sin either. It covered. Only the blood of Christ takes it away. So if they're offering sacrifices in the future after the cross in the millennial reign, wouldn't it be probably a memorial type of a thing? And not, they're not doing it to get their sins taken away is, is what I believe about the matter. So if you want to understand the issue of sacrifices, you've got to study Hebrews. That's what they believed and taught about those things. But look in 2 Peter. We'll finish with this. 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, I believe Peter wrote his first epistle before Acts 15. That's what I believe. I think it was pretty early he wrote it. But I believe he wrote 2 Peter after Acts 15. Now, what does he teach? Does he teach a man saved by faith alone? Does he say, all you've got to do is believe and you'll go into the kingdom? It's a guarantee. Well, just read what he wrote. For an example, in chapter 1, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. And look, that is what Jesus taught in His earthly ministry. He taught very plainly. It's not enough just for them to say they believed, but they had to bring forth fruit. Okay? It's, it's faith plus works. Now, like, I always have to say this. I'm going to say it again. The works are nothing without the faith that produces it. Okay? But faith in what God said, if God said do these works, that's what faith would do. It's still ultimately the grace of God, the mercy of God, and the blood of Christ. Without that, nobody could be saved. But again, Paul said it's faith alone. You're justified the moment you believe. It's not what the Jewish apostles taught. 
He said, verse 5, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if a man does not abide in the vine... He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me and I in you. He said, if a man, if a branch does not abide and bring forth fruit, the branch is withered, cast away, and burned. He said, you've got to prove your faith by the fruit. Okay? That's what Peter's teaching here. Notice what he said. Verse 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Sins are not blotted out for the nation Israel until the second coming. There's a danger of them falling away. That's what the Bible says to the Jews in the tribulation period, not to us. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. I mean, <laughs> Paul said to the Thessalonians, knowing, beloved brethren, your election of God. He said, if you trusted Christ, you're electing Him, period. Peter said, wait a minute, you better make that election sure. We can't get any more sure than the moment we trusted Christ as our Savior. But notice, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You and I, in this age of grace, the moment we believe the gospel, we are translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. We're not looking to enter into it. We're in it, spiritually. These people are looking to enter into the kingdom. It hadn't been set up yet. He said, if you're going to enter it, you better do these things. It's not just faith. Add to your faith. Peter's still maintaining the same doctrine that the kingdom church had. Just because he knows Paul's got something new from the Lord doesn't mean Peter now changes everything he's doing. The little flock fizzled out. <laughs> I mean, they died out. They knew, the, they knew the kingdom was postponed. They knew they'd be resurrected to enter into it. Jerusalem was destroyed. Um, there were some... I had a pastor text me just the other day asking me about this. What about Barnabas? Well, Barnabas was in the kingdom church, but then he began to work with Paul. He received the gospel, the grace of God, and he transitioned into the body of Christ. But that is an exception, not the rule. The rule is the far majority of the little flock maintained their distinct hope and calling. And they did not become members of the body of Christ. There's a difference between the Israel of God and the body of Christ. And so, uh, but I, again, I have to finish with this. I say it, I got to keep saying it because I get accused of this. And it's like people don't want to listen to what I'm saying. The works of a man's flesh cannot save him in any age. But in this age, God said to him that worketh not, you don't have to prove anything, just believe. But in other ages, God said, if you believe, this is what you'll do. That's different.